on. Uh, the next talk will be by uh, my co-chair, Rosemary Killen, about the lunar neon X-rays we are seeing in LACE data. Okay, go. so we're moving on from water a bit. Um, this uh, study started because Dave Williams uh, was tasked with um, archiving the um, LACE data from Apollo 17. And um, then I had a, the fortunate uh, instance that a, a young man from South Korea wanted to work with us, and he um, went through this data and analyzed, in fact, not just the neon, but all of the, um, uh, the LACE data from uh, uh, mass per charge uh, about 1 to 40. So all of these data are being archived now. Um, so um, just, just to reiterate, um, Apollo 17 carried a package called LACE, um, the Lunar Atmosphere Composition Explorer, and that was on a, a package called ALSEP. Um, so it was in the Taurus Littrow Valley, and it was turned on in 1971, a long time ago. Um, and, and we reanalyzed these data, and we actually found some interesting things. Um, so um, just the highlights, um, these are Apollo 17 data that have been reanalyzed. We looked at NEON 20. Uh, and we got densities um, on the order of 3 plus or minus 1.5 times 10 cubed. Um, so the first thing I noticed was that these densities cannot be modeled using um, a photoionization lifetime. The photoionization lifetime of neon is 100 days. And um, so this is the first conundrum, um, and there's a second conundrum. Um, we actually used NEON-22 to um, derive NEON-20, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, the canonical theory is that um, the NEON-20, of course, is uh, formed by the impingement of the solar wind onto the dayside surface, and then at nighttime, then the, the NEON um, slowly accumulates. Um, the red curve there is the temperature, and that's taken from the thermocouple, which was left on the surface also by the ALSEP package. So we know when, um, when dusk and dawn are from the temperature, and um, indeed this is the third lunation you see that neon accumulates um, during the night time, and also on the fourth lunation. Um, but there, there were times when the neon density actually decreased during the night. Okay, so this, um, this uh, spectrometer itself was not calibrated, but an identical um, instrument was calibrated, and we used the calibration. Um, they were initially interested only in uh, argon and, and CH3, and we added the, um, the red lines to calibrate all of the other um, masses. So why did we use NEON-22? Well, NEON-22, um, we, we assume it is uncontaminated. NEON-20, um, I mean, mass-20 or mass-per-charge-20 contains NEON-20, and um, argon, doubly charged argon, but also HF, which is a known uh, ubiquitous contaminant on mass spectrometers. And we know what the ratio of neon 22 to neon 20 is in the solar wind. So that's what we did, and, and we got fairly consistent neon densities over all of the lunations that we studied. Um, so um, OJ, whom you just heard speaking, um, did some simulations. Um, on the left, you see the simulation assuming a lifetime of 100 days, and on the right, um, a lifetime of four and a half days. Um, our data imply the lifetime of NEON is four and a half days, not the photoionization lifetime. Um, so we also, initially we thought, well, is there a correlation with the solar wind uh, fluctuation, and, and of course, if the lifetime is 100 days, then there's not going to be any correlation. Um, so um, look at what happens during the magnetotail cross. Of course, during when the moon is in the Earth's magnetotail, then um, the solar wind is, is highly reduced. Uh, so um, the, what, what you see on the, on the upper plot is um, the, the neon at the surface uh, in the nighttime, and then um, you see uh, the surface density on the far side um, over here. 
uh, when, when the moon is in, um, in the magnetotail, the far side is at nighttime, and, um, and there's, there's very little solar wind impinging. And you do have um, correlations in, in the um, neon. Uh, theoretically, of course, is, this isn't measured, but you would theoretically have correlations with solar wind if, um, uh, if, if the lifetime was um, four and a half days. Uh, so let's look at other observations. Um, our, our measurements agree with those of Cook et al. on LRO, from data on LRO LAM. We um, disagree with the results of Benna from, um, from Laddie, which was um, between 50% and an order of magnitude higher. So this is, um, a dis uh, it's, it's um, doesn't agree. Um, and also, the, the chance on uh, Sean Rian um, had a mass spectrometer. They didn't see any neon. This was um, near the um, South Pole. And they, they, uh, they reported um, a, a clutter of species near ADA. I mean, we, we actually um, had counts at those high um, mass uh, per charge, but it was clearly noise in our instrument. So. Um, so there are two possible conclusions. Either our densities are correct and the uh, lifetime of neon in the, uh, on the moon is not the photoionization lifetime, but something shorter. Or um, our data are incorrect and the photoionization lifetime is the correct lifetime. So um, <clears throat> I think um, it would be nice to have additional data on um, ne the neon exosphere, because after you know all of these decades, uh, well, first off, we don't know what the neon density looks like on the day side, and um, we we aren't really sure what the neon density is on the night side. So that's it. Thank you, Rosemary. <coughs> we have plenty of time for questions. Did you uh, look at other ionization processes like charge exchange or anything like that that might have uh, increased the loss rate? Um, no, but there are, I mean, we didn't model other processes, but there, there are other processes. I mean, sputtering, impact vaporization, charge exchange are all possibilities. So. Hey, Rosemary. Uh, first, I guess, is the neon uh, from the solar wind uh, highly variable? Uh, it seems like that would be something that uh, could be looked at. Through right. Um, uh, the, heavy, the heavy elements in the solar wind actually are highly enhanced um, in CMEs and solar energetic particle events. Um, so, um, the heavy elements are actually much more variable than the protons. You can uh, the proton and helium abundance is, is in the um, the database that you can get on the the um, CCMC. But you you also there are published um, reports of measurements of, of the heavy ions, and they are highly variable. Uh, you know, if I, another question is that um, did uh, Bennett's data, were they looking at 22 as well? No, I believe they were, they were looking at 20. So that, that could explain the, certainly the, the larger uh, it could. number if density if these other species are contributing and they were not correctly accounted for. Um, also, on the night side, you know, if neon is starting to absorb as the temperature decreases, then uh, that could explain some of the, uh, the decrease during the night. I know uh, we normally don't expect neon to, to absorb, but you know the, the soil is very, very uh, absorptive. And, it, uh, it would be interesting to see why it would um, decrease sometimes and not others. Um, but, but I see no reason, and actually this was noted by Hodges in one of his early papers that he saw this decrease 
in neon during the night side, uh, during the nighttime, on some lunations. And then it was more or less forgotten by the community that this happens. Okay, if uh, there are no more comments or questions, then I think we are just a minute or two ahead of schedule. So we think 